We have a very exciting opening keynote this morning with, from John Raincourt from the ONC, so I'm not going to hold you too much longer, but I do want to briefly just introduce him. John Raincourt is the Director of the Interoperability Division in the Office of Policy for the ONC, or the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. As director, he oversees the policy implementation through activities such as the Trust Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, state and Medicaid interoperability efforts, public health, including the opioid emergency, value-based transformation enabled by health IT, consumer engagement and data access, and engagement with behavioral health. During his career in health policy, John has worked on Capitol Hill both as a patient advocate and as a journalist, and we're so excited to have him here to, today to speak on TEFCA. So without further ado, I will invite John to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Shreya and Myhin and everyone in Michigan. It is really great to be here, um, being from the Midwest and coming back to a, a nice cool uh, summer day um, as opposed to the blistering heat of DC. So um, as Shreya mentioned, I am the director of the interoperability division within the Office of Policy at ONC. And just as a little bit of background about ONC, we are the principal federal agency that's charged with coordinating federal health IT policy. And ONC is made up of a broad team of clinicians, uh, including Andy Gettinger, who leads our cl uh, clinical team, who will be here at the conference, uh, but also uh, legal folks, um, including our policy team, which is led by Elise Anthony, who's here. Um, we also have technology people at ONC, and policy people like myself. Uh, I've been at a ONC for about eight years working on interoperability. I started my work on the state HIE program where I got a lot of opportunities to interact with Michigan specifically. I wanna tell you a little bit more about my background and um, what drives me. So no presentation would be complete without a baby picture. So um, wanted to uh, share with you about uh, three special ladies in my life. Um, and I'll start with the uh, move from the right to the left. Is, uh, and the, the bottom is my daughter, Ellen, and uh, my wife, Anne. And uh, it was only about 11 months ago that she was born. Um, so exciting uh, going to the hospital, but um, certainly challenging when you get there and they start asking you questions about, you know, uh, what tests have been done on the pregnant uh, wife and, you know, what, uh, whether she's GBS positive or not. And you're kind of thinking, you know, but, you know, my professional world is about making sure that this, this data is available at the time of need. Um, and then when you leave the hospital and you're, you know, overwhelmed with joy and the nurse comes up to you and hands you the yellow folder and says, do not forget this dad, you need to deliver this to the pediatrician and just thinking like, why is it that they're not able to send this to the pediatrician or why can't the pediatrician uh, be able to pull this data down when we arrive? Um, so um, just a, a couple of uh, uh, personal uh, anecdotes of how uh, my life has been, uh, has experienced interoperability challenges. And then I, I want to mention also on the left is my sister Liz, who is uh, intellectually disabled and a Medicaid recipient in Illinois. So I have a very uh, personal connection to the Medicaid program and the benefits that it can provide for our most vulnerable citizens. And also the challenges that we face uh, for those folks and trying to make sure that data is available to ensure that they get the care that they need, the supports that they need, uh, et cetera. So um, I want to uh, first give an outline of really what we're going to get into today. And I'm going to start out by giving some context on uh, why we need the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, and then we'll talk a bit about uh, specifically what the different parts are of the uh, TEFCA, and then we'll talk about the network that we envision to be created through this work, and then get a little bit deep on some of the privacy and security provisions, since um, this is a legal conference after all. Uh, so to set the context, we have computerized our nation's healthcare system. High tech drove that. And we are really moving, we've moved from 
uh, roughly less than 10% of hospitals having uh, electronic health records to now more than 90% of them. But the problem is that those computers don't talk to each other. And what that means is care is not made more efficient and patients haven't seen increased access to uh, their health data. And Congress recognized this uh, in the 21st Century Cures Act and included a provision in there on, uh, or a section on interoperability, which uh, included the, um, the, the TEFCA uh, provision. And uh, really one of the things that I was looking to address was this uh, level of complexity that we see within our healthcare system. So right now, providers have to connect to multiple different networks in order to achieve the uh, information that they need to provide the care that they would like to provide. And really, this doesn't work if we're trying to uh, scale interoperability uh, nationwide. Uh, along the same lines, there's costs associated with that. Each time that a organization needs to connect, they have to go through those technical and legal costs uh, of connecting. And this has been borne out through uh, the data. Uh, we, uh, there's a American Hospital Association survey that found that 78% of hospitals have to use more than one electronic method to send records. And so, as I mentioned, uh, Congress recognized this in the 21st Century Cures Act and included Section 4003, which called on uh, ONC to develop or support a trusted exchange framework and common agreement. And that would include things like um, a common method for authenticating per uh, participants, common rules of the road uh, for exchange, and so on. And that's really what TEFCA is about, is... Um, creating a baseline technical and legal requirements for nationwide network-to-network -network sharing of electronic health information. In our approach to TEFCA, we set three goals for ourselves. And the first is to provide a single on-ramp to nationwide connectivity. Again, setting that baseline legal and technical requirements for network-to-network -network connectivity. The second goal is that electronic health information securely follows you where and when it is needed. Um, this is to address those problems that I mentioned that I've experienced, that I know you all have experienced with just getting your records to where they need to be. Thirdly, the goal, third goal is to support nationwide scalability. TEFCA is going to create that network of networks that will grow over time. And what we recognize is that a single network across the country is not feasible. However, a network of networks that connects data is feasible. And where are we right now? Uh, our uh, f first step for uh, TEFCA was to just do outreach to the public. And uh, we did that and put together our first draft of the uh, Trust Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. And uh, we got a lot of feedback on that and recognized that uh, we want to really make this right. And so we decided to put out a second draft of the TEFCA. And we did that just a couple months ago. And our next steps from that are we are seeking comment from the public. And so um, by June 17th, we asked that folks to please, please, please comment on the TEFCA. And that comment period is going to come to a close um, at June 17th. Um, after that, uh, we will uh, begin the process of moving towards developing a full common agreement with an industry partner. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that throughout the presentation. So I want to start out by talking about exactly what is the, what are the trusted exchange framework and common agreement. There are uh, a couple different parts that work together here. And the first is the trusted exchange framework. And these are the non-binding non but foundational principles for achieving our goals. And the trusted exchange framework is really um, designed to facilitate that trust among health information networks. These principles include standardization, transparency, competition and non-discrimination, privacy, security, and safety, uh, but also access and population level data. So that's one part of the TEFCA that we had released for comment. 
And the other part is uh, part of what will, be, will make up the common agreement. So the common agreement is the legal data sharing agreement that will provide the governance necessary to scale a functioning uh, system of connected health information networks. And it's gonna be made up of three different parts. The first is the minimum required terms and conditions or MRTCs, I apologize if we slip into acronyms, but um, that uh, part of the common agreement will be written by ONC, and this is the uh, required terms and conditions that we will be setting because we see that there currently is variation among data use agreements that uh, allow for network connectivity, or that do not allow for network connectivity, sorry. Um, the, the areas of variation, if you will. Uh, in addition to that, there are many parts of uh, connectivity, or sorry, data use agreements across the country that are working very well, and uh, those parts we did not uh, work to include in what we've released for comments, but instead will be developed further later on, and these will be the additional required terms and conditions, and this includes things like how governance functions within uh, the future common agreement. Thirdly is the QHIN technical framework, and this is the um, technical aspects of what is required to connect. What we heard very clearly on the first draft of the TEFCA was that we should separate out those technical components so they can be updated separately. And so what is the structure of the common agreement? And, and the first key point to recognize is that TEFCA is designed, and we are working to design it to uh, work for all different types of stakeholders. That includes health information networks, providers, public health, uh, individuals as well, technical uh, technology developers, government agencies. And so we've worked with uh, the, the whole range of the healthcare system to uh, ensure that, uh, that this can work. And, and really, uh, the point that needs to be made is that the success of TEFCA really depends on close coordination with the private sector. So we're so excited to, to be here today to talk about TEFCA and to hear from you all. I do want to mention that we do have information sheets on how TEFCA impacts each of these different stakeholder groups on our website. So www.healthit.gov slash TEFCA has all of that along with all the information about TEFCA itself. Um, we have a very specific definition of uh, health information networks and this drives what uh, is the definition, what are the definitions throughout TEFCA. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of this, but you can uh, read it while I'm uh, explaining that um, I wanted to include it to point out another important point, which is that our policies all interact with one another, and uh, this definition is the same definition that's used in the proposed rule that uh, is closing its comment period today. <laughs> uh, apologies if uh, I'm taking away from your time to, to put those comments together. Um, Nevertheless, we wanted to make sure that all the policies were closely coordinated and very precise, as you can see here. And so how will the common agreement work? I'm going to start by describing the middle part here, which it will be a um, network of connected, what we call qualified health information networks. And these will be those entities that meet a certain threshold of privacy and security that we'll talk about more later in the presentation, but then uh, we'll all be connecting to one another and then we'll uh, flow down their data to their participants and participant members. So it's actually just the, co the qualified health information networks that will sign the common agreement, but their networks will uh, be very similar to how they already exist and include those participants, participant members, and individual users that all are able to connect up. And those are sort of uh, at the bottom of the hierarchy here uh, where those um, QHINs are, are going to be um, facilitating connection within their uh, particular network. I wanted to give a couple examples of what those uh, QHINs will look like. And in this case, we have a QHIN that's made up of health IT developers. We get a lot of questions of whether X, Y, or Z can qualify as a QHIN. And uh, really, that could include 
um, a network of just health IT developers, and that might be someone uh, or developers that offer a consumer application that connects into an individual user or a uh, analytics service provider, for example. In this other example of a qualified health information network, uh, we have various participants, which could include a health information exchange on the right or Medicaid agency or other uh, uh, entities that would be participants. And at the top, we have what we call the recognized coordinating entity. And this is the entity that will provide the oversight and governance for the qualified health information networks that fall under that umbrella. And you can see those arrows pointing back and forth with ONC, and that's because we will have a close cooperation with that entity through a cooperative agreement. Let me tell you just a bit more about what the recognized coordinating entity's responsibilities will be. At the top, and perhaps most important, is to develop, update, implement, and maintain the common agreement. The QN will also be responsible for identifying and designating qualified health information networks. So do they meet all of the requirements of the common agreement and are they able to exchange data technically as is specified in the QHIN technical framework? The RC is also gonna be responsible for modifying and updating the QHIN technical framework, holding pub public listening sessions and so on. And in order to have a single recognized coordinating entity, we have put out a notice of funding opportunity for the recognized coordinating entity, and that's currently on the street. Uh, I can't say too much about it because of the procurement process, uh, but I can mention a couple points about what it is that we're looking for in the recognized coordinating entity, and this is in response to public comment that is really important that this recognized coordinating entity be uh, independent. And so a couple of the requirements are that the applicants must be nonprofit organizations, uh, but also that if they are awarded, they cannot be affiliated with a qualified health information network. And so what can the common agreement be used for? We've talked a lot about the structure, but you, guys are, you all are probably thinking about uh, how the data will be flowing through the network and what, what data might be included in there. And so we have uh, specified the exchange purposes for which data can flow through the network. And I'm gonna talk through those here, starting with the right, which uh, starts with treatment. And that's pretty straightforward. M most networks uh, do uh, treatment exchange already. And you'll see that we have an asterisk there, uh, which says that um, this is uh, applied to and limited to covered entities and business associates only. And the reason for that is the definition of treatment that we include in the minimum required terms and conditions is the same as that included in HIPAA. And therefore, only HIPAA covered entities and business associates can avail themselves of this exchange purpose. Moving around uh, from the right, bottom right to the left, public health exchange is another exchange purpose. Um, utilization review is another. And this is actually a subset of HIPAA's definition of payment exchange. Um, we used only a subset in this second draft because we heard feedback from the public on the first draft that including all of payment was too much and that we needed to uh, be a bit more focused there. Um, moving on, uh, we also have business planning and development and then quality assessment and improvement activities. Those are a subset of HIPAA defined operations of permitted purpose for data sharing. Again, uh, a subset because uh, we wanted to narrow the focus uh, but accomplish uh, those other use cases that stakeholders have uh, said are incredibly important. Next is benefits determination. I want to be clear, this is not healthcare benefits determination, but other uh, benefits determination that could be uh, required by federal or state entities. So think of the Social Security Administration looking for data to validate a disability claim, for example. And then lastly is individual access services, is, um, so individuals can access their own data. And there are three ways that data will move throughout the network or exchange modalities, if you will. Uh, the first is uh, QHIN broadcast query. So uh, you can think of this as the go fish or 
find data when I don't know where it exists. And in my example of being in the hospital, my wife and I could have asked the hospital to send out a uh, query to the network to find all lab tests that had been done on her before showing up at the hospital. In the second uh, QHIN targeted query, that's where you actually know where that data resides and can go and find it. So when we showed up at the pediatrician's office, we could have said, you know, go get our data from that hospital about the discharge. Lastly is QHIN message delivery or push, and this is actually new to the second draft of the TEFCA. And uh, we added this because it's really, we've heard that uh, pushing of data is really important for care coordination use cases, but also for public health use cases. And here I'm gonna go through a couple examples to get um, very specific on what the uh, data flow looks like. And in this one, the example is for a benefits determination use case, and it's using the QHIN broadcast query uh, modality. And if we start on the bottom left where we have that uh, Social Security Administration participant, they would send a query up to their qualified health information network, who then would fan that query out to all other qualified health information networks. And it's kind of hard to show that in a uh, picture, but uh, you, you can see we have a zoomed in version of just that query going to the uh, QHIN B, who then sends that query down to all its participants and finds the data maybe only in the uh, box number four there, pulls that back up uh, through step five, sends it to the um, QHIN A, who then sends it back to the Social Security Administration. Uh, for this example, we were considering a quality assessment or improvement activity where you would have a, um, uh, a, a, a you know where the data resolves, uh, uh, resides, and that's with um, Dr. Smith. And the entity in the bottom left there, which is hard for me to see here, um, is able to send up a uh, query to uh, QHIN B, and they send it to the QHIN. They know where the data resides down at Dr. Smith, and then that returns back. Uh, in this last example, you could think of a referral from a primary care physician to a dermatologist, and they want to send a summary of that care. Uh, this would be using the push methodology, and this would be for a treatment use case. And pretty straightforward that um, primary care physician sends the data up to their QHIN, across to the other QHIN, and then down to the dermatologist. And so I mentioned we were going to talk about a few of the privacy and security requirements that are included in the common agreement. And to talk about that, I, I want to really break down a couple components of the context in which uh, TEFCA will operate. So uh, first and foremost, uh, one of the goals of TEFCA is that everyone is able to play by the same set of rules. And that means that we could have different types of entities participating in the network who currently operate under different um, legal uh, constraints. So we need to think about those constraints that could be federal, uh, those policies that may come from the state, Think about business associates and covered entities, but also non-HIPAA entities such as uh, phone apps that are connecting in for individual access services. And important to point out that uh, the common agreement will complement applicable law, including for those non-HIPAA entities. And what we've built into the common agreement is a order of precedence to allow for uh, or to recognize that in the case where conflicts may exist among those policies, applicable law would apply first. And um, just as a couple examples of how TEFCA builds upon that, uh, you have um, for those entities that are connecting into the network, uh, they are actually going to be required to comply with HIPAA's minimum necessary provisions as if it applies to electronic health information. So that's a broader set of data than just protected health information. And so this is just one example of how TEFCA is going above or building upon applicable law. QHINs, uh, participants, and participant members are not limited to what is included in the common agreement. They may have their framework agreements, as we call them, that could have other business cases that build on uh, what is in the common agreement, provided it doesn't conflict with 
the common agreement. So all of these parts come together to govern trusted exchange under TEFCA. And to dive into some of the um, specific privacy and security requirements in the last few minutes here, I'm gonna start with um, the minimum privacy and security requirements for those qualified health information networks. And they're actually going to be held to a higher standard because of their importance on the network. And this will be regardless of whether they're a business associate or covered entity, they have to follow the privacy and security requirements of HIPAA, but at, have, they have to apply those as if they um, uh, would apply to electronic health information. So again, going a bit broader there. Uh, they also will have to evaluate their uh, programs in accordance with NIST 171, which is a uh, higher uh, security uh, standard. Then as you move down the network, the uh, participants and participant members, they will have to uh, follow a, a set of minimum privacy and security requirements as well. Uh, and so it's important to note if those entities are business associates or covered entities, they have to comply with HIPAA privacy and security requirements. But for those other entities, we do impose upon them or plan to impose these um, additional requirements that they uh, have to adhere to, which include uh, ensuring that they take reasonable steps to protect the confidentiality, in integrity, and availability of electronic health information. And that includes things like maintaining reasonable uh, and appropriate administrative safeguards for protecting EHI, monitoring workforce compliance, uh, et cetera. There are identity proofing requirements that are built into the minimum required terms and conditions that will be required throughout the network. Um, and what is identity proofing? That's the process for verifying that an individual is who they uh, claim to be. And we uh, have proposed that the common agreement rec will require identity proofing at the IAL level two, and that would be for all entities uh, and all individuals when seeking access to their data on the network. For authentication, uh, users must be authenticated each time that they request data, and we have a floor of what is called AAL2, which is uh, two-factor authentication to anyone as they are uh, connecting into the network for access to data. There are uh, breach notification requirements that are built into TEFCA that uh, track with what is in HIPAA, uh, but also we have a uh, requirement that no electronic health information be disclosed uh, outside of the United States with some uh, exceptions for individual requests. We do have a request for comment on these, uh, on this particular provision, uh, as well as all of the, uh, the, the TEFCA. Uh, next, we have uh, a provision that we call meaningful choice, which uh, would be for an individual to express their preference that their information not be disclosed through the TEFCA network. Um, this would be done on a prospective basis. So um, the choice would be uh, expressed by an individual coming to the network and then would actually be fanned out to all of the network so that that uh, meaningful choice is honored. Also, we are requiring that all participants and participant members have a written privacy summary and that it mirror the ONC model privacy notice um, this has to include how an individual exercises their meaningful choice, uh, but also includes the requirement of uh, having a contact person for that entity. So I want to talk about the major updates that have occurred to the uh, Trust Exchange Framework and Common Agreement uh, since the first draft. And we've touched on some of these, um, uh, such as the exchange purposes being updated and push being added. I did mention that the QHIN technical framework was added, um, but then also, and I didn't get into this, uh, we did broaden the definition of qualified health information network in order to see that more entities would be able to qualify. Lastly, we heard clearly in the feedback from the uh, first draft that uh, the timelines were too short for future updates uh, and for compliance to future updates, so we extended those uh, in the second draft. So here's my contact information. Um, I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion and also to then questions from you all on how we can make this right for 
folks in Michigan, folks all across the country. Thank you.